without any further ado, I let our friend Daryl take over. And uh, now we find out what the big secret is, what the topic of the presentation. It's Daryl Shin. Thank you, Professor. It's, it's always an honor to be invited by Professor Fekete, and, and dauntingly so for me, you know, what am I going to say? It's a tradition. This is not the first time. No. So uh, th this is time the uh, extreme nervousness has happened before, all right, <laughs> and insecurity. Um, but um, uh, the topic, in fact, the, the uh, topic uh, it was sort of generally formed, but the title came from Frank just this morning. And uh, he said, the fracture, you're going to speak about the fracture. And I said, that, that captures it, the fracture. Because when this began, um, there were so few people who understood, and I wasn't one of them. Um, for example, Professor Fekete in the Austrian School of Economics, who saw the system for what it was, a flawed system. Hyman Minsky was another one of those people who saw the system for what it was, a flawed system. That the farther it went along, the more dangerous it would become. And we're now in the point where we can see the fracture. A year ago, there wasn't a visible fracture, except to those who were extremely paranoid and sensitive and, you know, were pointed at things and people go, what's that? And we go and they look at it and say, you know, you should get a drink. But now it's, it's rather obvious. Something is going on and what's it afoot? Mm -hmm. And so t today, um, I want to talk about how it may play itself out, where the fracture may lead us to. But to begin, um, I want to start with a quote from, from my book that I wrote a long time ago. And it came to me whole piece, and I wrote it down. I was rather stunned when this thing came out. And uh, I didn't know what it would be used for, but uh, here it is. And it, was, it came, and it was called um, Time of the Vulture. In times of expansion, it is to the hair the prizes go. Quick, risk-taking, and bold, his qualities are exactly suited to the times. In periods of contraction, the tortoise is favored. Slow and conservative, quick only to retract his vulnerable head and neck. His is the wisest bet, when the slow and sure is preferable to the quick and easy. Every so often, however, there comes a time when neither the hare nor the tortoise is the victor. This is when both the bear and the bull have been vanquished, when the patches upon which the bull once grazed are long gone, and the bear's lair itself lies buried deep beneath the rubble of economic collapse. This is the time of the vulture, for the vulture feeds neither upon the pastures of the bull nor the stored up wealth of the bear. The vulture feeds instead upon the blind ignorance and denial of the ostrich. The time of the vulture is at hand. We are getting close to something, all right? And there's been a lot of debate about what that something is, what it's going to look like, and it's what its consequences are going to be. And we all have projections, thoughts about that, all right? And time is going to tell what is true and what isn't. My sense is, it's like, uh, I see myself as somebody walking by and, and uh, I notice a, a tree being, uh, being sawed down, or uh, let's say some uh, rot among the, at the root, okay? And, I, and the more I look at the tree, the more I think, wow, this is a very large tree, you know? And the more I look at the root system, I think, this is going to be nasty. And people are walking by and, you know, they're, the tree's been there for years and they sit in the shade and they're quite happy with the tree. And um, I know that tree's going to come down. And whether it falls this way or that way is the only thing I'm not sure about. And um, in this quest, in this looking at this tree, this economic life force, uh, I was, I've been very fortunate to have found um, <coughs> <coughs> Professor Fekete, who had been looking at the tree a lot longer than I have, and in a much more disciplined way. But, um, in fact, what I'm going to talk about is uh, he's, he, he already alluded to and gave me the courage to sit there and say, okay, I, I think this is going to happen too. But uh, let me rewind um, backwards to um, what really brought me to this field originally was my, my curiosity about the Great Depression. 
And um, I had no idea, but somehow in my mind it just got lodged as uh, wondering what it was, what caused it. And um, so I set about trying to find out for myself. And I went up in the internet, and I remember my first reaction was, look at all this opinion. I mean, lots of opinion. College professors, people said this, people said that. And they may have been right, but I didn't know it. And I'm not sure they did either. All right? And so I just kept reading. And eventually things started falling into place. And uh, a model started developing about really what had happened. That uh, what's, what impressed me about the Great Depression, and really what brought up the question in the first place, was its effects. To me, the metaphor I've come up about the Great Depression that worked for a while was of a toilet. All right, I'm not, not speaking in a disparaging term, but the toilet is a critical appliance in the ongoing functioning of a house. It's necessary. All right, it's like air conditioning in Tucson, where we live. If you're there in the summer and your air conditioning goes out, you're not going to be there the next day. And if you are, you're in trouble. That's the same way with the toilet. If the toilet stops functioning, the household is in trouble. And so it's one of those givens that we go over years, that we take for granted. It functions, you know, I mean, you could raise generations of that house. Change the valve, you know, put some more plumbing in, you know, get a jacuzzi toilet or a Kohler toilet instead of the old one that your father left you in the house, and, and you go on. But when the toilet broke in the Great Depression, it was something else. Because usually you could just call up the plumber and hey, he'd come over and he'd look at it and he'd, you know, and after all, you'd already gone through your little jiggle, you know, jiggle, pouring water in, okay, bringing the water level back up. Boy, look, I could be a plumber. <laughs> Why should I pay 60 bucks an hour? Things working again. Okay, then probably a couple of weeks later you actually have, have to call a real one. But this time, the mm. Great Depression is, when you call the plumber, and the man came over and he looked at it, he said, um, I don't know what to do. And you said, well, what's wrong? And he said, well, I'm, I'm not, it's just not working. I said, well, well, let's just buy another toilet. And like he said, Mr. Shoon, I don't think that's going to work. Wow. I don't think that's going to work. Well, that's what happened during the Great Depression. For the first time in the history of the world, it came to a halt. Nothing that they could do, all the king's men, all the king's horses, couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. And they tried. They did everything they could. The suffering was extraordinary. It was widespread. It took over the whole globe. All right. And eventually, years later, a great world war started. Demand pushed onto the system and, and the machine started going again. All right? And what happened is, is that in the aftermath, here we were in the 50s and 60s, things started expanding. Economists whose work it was to look at certain things, or it might be truer to say, whose work it is not to look at such things, ignored the phenomenon of the Great Depression to a very great degree and went on. They didn't really ignore it by saying denial, it didn't happen. What it did was, uh, we've got the tools in place to keep it from happening again. It started of its own accord. Nothing they did brought it back. It wasn't because they interjected some discipline into the system and kept interest rates high and squeezed out the excess liquidity. It wasn't because they just poured liquidity in the system again and recovered and started going. No, a war happened. They did both of those to varying degrees of success. They, there was some mitigation of suffering, which was enormous, and it kept going. But pretty much, by and large, by the 50s and 60s, kids going to Princeton, the next generation of economists, were pretty much convinced that, well, at least it was behind them, all right? That they had gone through it. It was, it was a problem in the past. It was like the Black Plague or the, um, the great flu pandemic of 1917 to 1919 that swept the country, swept the world. But it was in the past, it was done. They, and, and we've got tools in place to figure it out. We've got FDIC, we've got Glass-Steagall, we've got this, we've got that. We've got an integrated system. We've got, we're much more sophisticated than we were then. All right? This at least is what they told themselves. And I think it suffice for them to go to sleep at night. Something unusual happened that they didn't expect. 
And this happened in Japan in 1990. All right. Now the Japanese are very interesting. Well, history is interesting. All right. History is fascinating. Basically, it's the story of a schizophrenic group of people in an outpatient clinic called the Earth that are left to fend for themselves with a few tools and you know and some time and what we do with it. But Japan, we, we they they came to the party rather the Western party rather late. All the East did. All right, they were shaken out of their Eastern slumber by the the thrust of Western imperialism, mainly through Britain and the United States. We were the ones that ended with our our gunboats in, in right in their harbor. But Japanese are very very quick, and they tried to figure out what was going on, and um, they armed themselves very quickly. They sent. Uh, uh, delegations around the Western world to try and learn what this thing was that they had no idea. Of. You know, I mean, they had their own feudal system. They had great architecture, great silks, great you know aesthetic level, but they certainly didn't have the wherewithal to go all halfway around the world and, and to have people get on their knees before their ar their armies. All right, which the West had, and which the Japanese, being a warrior culture, absolutely respected. Well, they went around the world. And it's really funny, what I love about it is that they investigated the way the British ruled themselves. They look at the Americans, they look at the French, they look at all the governments of the world. And they came back to Japan and they sat there together sipping, I'm sure, some sort of Japanese green tea and you know, their, their robes and delivering their talk. And the consensus was this, by God, of all the people who ruled themselves, those Prussians really had something going. All right? They loved the way the Germans did it because it reflected the way the Japanese did it. Discipline, attention to detail rather conservative approach, okay, you know, hold on to the thing, that's the way they were. They recognized some similarity in that and they liked it and said, let's leave that, all right? So they armed themselves very quickly, as fast as they could, and decided to enter the, uh, the modern world and they sort of piggybacked uh, the German entry in the war. They liked the Germans anyway. You know, let the Germans put order together in the Western world. We'll do our bit over here in the eastern part of the world. Okay, this whole place is a little undegether, a lot of undisciplined going on, and nobody really, you know, acting the way they should. You know, let, we'll, so we'll take care of our end of the world. Well, one of the curious stories about what happened during that war was when they got to Hong Kong, all right? When the Japanese armies entered Hong Kong, they went over to the banks, grabbed the employees of the Bank of England, put guns to the head, and locked them in the room and threatened to kill them. Threatened to kill them unless they told them how their system worked. <laughs> All right? I mean, they didn't sit there and go to Hong Kong, let's go to the opium store, let's do this, let's do that. Uh -uh. They went to the banks, they knew what they're doing, and they put guns to the head of the British bankers and made them give up the goods. All right? So when the war ended, the Japanese, of course, were on the losing end. But they had one of the secrets of the kingdom that they didn't have before. They had figured out, they knew the knowledge of the West imperialist thrust into the East, which is basically a combination of Western technology and f British banking. Right? Borrow, mount your armies, stay the herd of the yield curve, grab what you can along the way, pay off your debts as you go along, and it worked for a while. It always catches up with you. As we'll learn today, time is the enemy of the capitalist credit system. All right? And we're at the end of that system now. But the Japanese went back and they built their system of banking into it and they built it up and they built it in such a way that other people couldn't get into it. All right? They wanted to have their own banks, their, their, their own zaibatsu, their own trading groups. This is an ancient culture. All right? And they certainly didn't like what had happened to them. But they didn't like being in that position in the first place. And they, to the best of their ability, they, sit there, they modeled their system on a system that they felt that would enable them to come back into the, what was going on in the post-World War situation with some power. And history is a funny thing. Their coming back in coincided with Edwards Deming, who happened to be over there in Japan, on his own, doing the census. All right? Edwards Deming is now known as the father of the Quality Revolution. Right? At the end of the war, nobody listened to Demings in America. No one did. No one listened to this guy from the Bell Labs, a physicist by training. All right? But over in Japan, they knew they had to get their quality act together. And they heard that there was an American quality control expert over there. His name was Edwards Deming. They found him. 
So they asked me, so well, listen, this is 1948. What, what, we got to do something. He said, all right. So he said, let's have a meeting. They had a meeting. At which time he came to the meeting, all these middle managers were sitting there. They're all ready to listen to what he had to tell them about why America became such a supremely important power with such a massive machine that could blow them to smithereens. They were ready to listen. And Mr. Deming looked at that group of people and he knew this wasn't going to go. Because he had already dealt with the same problem in the United States. These were the wrong people. If you were going to induce this level of change that was necessary for his system to work, you had to talk to the people at the top. The people who, and especially in a top-down hierarchical society like Japan, had the power, the wherewithal, and the responsibility to shift things so they would happen. Because they were going to go against every ingrained thing in that society to do what he suggested to do. This is a top-down, naturally top-down, male hierarchical society. All right? Centuries of just, this is the way it is. And Edwards Deming knew that if you were going to bring quality to anywhere, you had to start at the bottom with the frontline workers and the people who worked there, you know? And they had to have the, the ability to stop that, that line from going as soon as they saw mistakes, as soon as something was going wrong. And he knew that those middle managers would never be able to have that kind of change. So he told them, he said, I need to talk to the top people. They went back, they told him. The next time he's met before this group of Japanese, I think it was 1948, perhaps 1949, they were there. The boys, the guys, and he gave a short talk about what Japan could do, and he gave them, it was about quality. It was about how you induce quality, how you empower the worker, all the way down the line, how you, the worker would do it if they felt you were, they were being protected, that if they felt you had their interests at heart, and you had to give them the power to make changes on the line without you okaying it without you sitting there over there. It had nothing to do with quality control experts looking at how many were coming, how many, you know. It, it, it was not a matter of slogans. He said, to hell with your slogans. To heck with your, 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 your goals. They don't work. And he told the Japanese that. All right? And then he said something to the Japanese. If you do this, in five years, the rest of the world is going to be calling for protection. I said that in 1948. That place was in devastation. In 1952, and every year after that, the Japanese took out full page ads in the Wall Street Journal thanking Dr. Deming. Starting in 1949, they gave a nationwide award for the corporation that incorporated his ideas into their system of production. All right? United States, no, we're on a different track. We had an advantage. I mean, we were number one. Okay? We were number one. Well, what happened is, with their banking system, is that these two things came together, the quality, the Japanese ability, the, the age that we were into, the age of machinery, the age of, of machinery, of an industry. So in the West, the, Jap the Germans really went up. Their optics, their cars, the machinery. I mean, they had it. They, inherently, there they were. You know, they could even import Guys from the Middle East, the Turks and working in the factories, their Mercedes were a lot better than anybody else's cars. All right? In the East, the Japanese had that same attention to detail, but they had Dr. Deming's system on it, and they just, they just were gangbusters. So by the time we hit the 80s, they had money flowing into their country that you couldn't believe. All right? Ford was sitting there. We had cars rattling. We had, you know, acrimonious, you know, labor unions. And, and they were doing studies, and they had come to the conclusion. One of their studies said, well, the reason why the Japanese cars are so good is their diet. They eat a lot of rice. You know? That one-page ad in the Wall Street Journal every year. Thank you, Dr. Danny. Rice, rice. You know? So what happened is, Funny thing happened in Japan, which relates to where we are today in America. The thing that nobody, that had been banished from our memory out of denial, and no one wants to look at this horrible thing, reappeared. But how did this happen in Japan? Well, let's go back. Money flowing in from overseas that they earned. I mean, this is earned money. Production, export, value. This isn't financial gadgetry and playing the market and, you know, and doing some derivative dance. No. This is, this is the nuts and bolts of a productive society. High rate of savings. 
Okay? Asia traditionally has a high rate of savings. All right? So they're rolling, they're rolling, they're rolling. They're more money coming in, more money coming in, more money coming in. Well, what happened is, is the Japanese, they're sort of like the Germans. You know, they have like to keep a tight lid on things. They don't like the things like things get out of control. They didn't have a long history with, with central banking. All right, but they did have a, they had some experts sitting over there with them and they decided to, what we should do to keep the lid on this thing, because there's so much money coming in here, let's tighten our interest rates. We, you know, we got to tap this thing down. You know, you know, this is, this might get out of hand. And I would say this is around 1984, 1985, mid-80s. Well, that may have been the right thing to do. It wasn't what happened. The reason is, history is a funny thing. It coincided with something going on in America. This time, Mr. Balanced Budget, Ronald Reagan, as they got elected on power, telling the American people that we needed to balance our budget, took over. We had a $1 trillion deficit at the end of 1980, after what, 200 years? By the time that kid left office, we owed $4 trillion. Tripled it in three years. And they still loved him. And you think why politicians don't lie to us? It works. It works, and we eat it up, as long as you tell us the right lies. And they made an industry out of it. But what Reagan did was over here, is that we were going on the tear of building up our military. All right? And we did it with borrowed money. We were sucking in the savings from Germany. We were sucking in the savings from Japan. We were paying out our interest rates. We were rolling. And when the word got back to Washington, D.C. that the Japanese were going to tighten up those interest rates, Man, did they feel that. They knew that that river of yen coming over Japan would stop. Japanese would rather put their money in interest bearing, you know, Japanese notes without a risk of, of foreign exchange problems. Keep it there. Very conservative. They were going to make it. That's, so that's what they decided to do. We're going to do this. Well, the Americans went over there and had a little chit chat with it. Japanese. And I don't think this was over iced tea. But what it was, they told him, said, you do this, if you do this, you're going to see some tariffs. We're going to put tariffs on your electronics, on your cars. We're going to put tariffs on everything you sell in our country. So you better think it over. Japanese thought it over. <laughs> Bad idea. Bad idea. Not a good idea at all. They kept their interest rates low. All right? So they kept the interest rates low. The Japanese economy just started exploding after 18, 1985. By 1990, it had reached a bubble of historic proportions. It exploded on the last day, December 31st, 19, 1989. By January 1st, it started into its descent. The Nikkei fell from what is it, 38,000 down to, it took 13 years to hit a bottom, around 8,300. Lost 80% of its value. Japanese real estate, commercial real estate, lost 80% of its value, all right? Huge that it just rocked them. This happened in 1990. Now, all of us were over here, trying to make a living, going to work every day, you know. I mean, I mean, we, we that was a, what was that, the decade of the, uh, uh, man, that was the 49ers. 49ers were rolling, Bill Walsh, you know. I mean, things were happening. But this is over in Japan, okay. But what happened is, the Japanese economy started contracting. Okay? It took a hit. It was like a gut check. It took a hit. It took a major, major, and it started contracting. And as it contracted, what happened is, is that the economy started going, it was certainly in a recession. Okay? Now, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Japanese, they, they never had this happen before. They never got their legs kicked out from under it again. So the American bankers are over there looking at this and going, mm, oh, this is what you gotta do, you gotta uh, put some money in this thing, you know, loosen up, put some money into the thing. Japanese, they're tight money boys. This is like the Germans. They said, that, that's what got us in trouble in the first place. You know, this loose money. You know, America's not gonna be, listen, you, you gotta do something here. This patient's sitting there, the blood pressure's going down, you know, put some, put some more pressure in it, you gotta keep it going up. I don't know, I don't know. That sort of got us in trouble in the first place. All right? So it went into recession, came out of recession, and by 1999, nine years later, everything's still going to squat. They thought, this is it. We're in trouble. We're heading into recession again. Free money. Zero for the first time in the history of the world. Zero percent money available for all Japanese banks. Zero percent money. Zero percent money, which is really a negative rate because they have inflation. They made it available. 
Okay? So the Japanese, it, pulls, it stops them from going to recession. They don't recover. They don't recover, but at least they don't sink further into recession. What people don't know is that what happened in 1990 when that thing collapsed, the Japanese are still reeling from. The Japanese have made it from then to now because they made trillions of dollars in export. They have the nation's highest rate of savings. And their population is so indebted as a result of the debts they ran up then, they still can't put any demand in the system. They have to service those debts. Those people bought houses. There's a guy, he's got a great website up, um, bullnotbull.com. He's a Ron Paul supporter. All right? He's half Japanese. And he told a story about his grandfather, okay, who's on the Japanese side of the family. He says his grandfather, you know, was a civil servant in Japan and always wanted to buy a house. Okay, home ownership, all right? And of course, things got more and more expensive, more and more expensive, more and more expensive. He couldn't afford it. And then he said, then the real estate market blew open, just fell apart at the seams in 1990, like everything else did. By 1994, he said, his grandfather thought, oh man, finally, I can afford a house. And he bought the family a house. That house has lost value since 1994. And the family isn't forever indebted on it to pay it off. You die, it doesn't matter, it goes to the kids. That's Japan. That's obligation. They don't have the money. What are you going to demand? Where's it going to come from? That's the downside of credit. That's when it happens in these situations so bad that it just cripples the ability of economy to get back on its feet because of what you have done to it to keep it together. So what happened is, and this is why it has relevance to us over here in the United States, is that the boys in Washington, D.C. saw this were quite amazing. Oh, man. I, you know, Paul Krugman, I never will forget his line. Probably around 1996. And Paul Krugman said, you know, I don't know where it's coming from, but it looks like the whiff, something's in the air. The whiff of deflation is back. It scared them. I mean, they, they thought it, the Balrog was gone. I mean, this was something that banished. It was, you know, we had FDIC, we had this. Japanese had all that stuff. You know, they, they weren't bank runs. The banks still stayed there. They, they made it through. But it just kept eating. It was like a cancer. It kept eating away, eating away, eating away, eating away. So, you learn from the past, don't you? I mean, that's what the past is for. You learn from it. So, when the dot-com bubble collapsed, and he saw it coming, gave a speech about irrational exuberance in 1996, Stock market kept going up. March 1997, he looked straight at the cameras and he said, we're going to raise interest rates. That stock markets reacted. Boom! Bond prices dropped. Stock market prices dropped. Ah! Irrational exuberance. Ah, we're learning, huh? Yeah, we learned. Phone call was made. Alan, shut your little mouth up if you want that job. Woo! Woo! Next month, Allen made a speech. He says, it's not the policy of the Federal Reserve to print monetary bubbles by the use of interest rates. Oh, well. You know? Sort of like saying it's not the uh, response of the doctor to use antibiotics in curing uh, pneumonia. Fine. So the bubble went up, it exploded, and it was huge. But when it did explode, they had this experience to go on. They had the experience that the Japanese didn't act quickly enough. All right? They had the experience of, they had all read the 1930s thing. In fact, it was rumored that Alan Greenspan, he used to wonder if he had been there during the 1930s, what would he have done? Could he have stopped it? You know? I mean, that, I mean that's, that's sort of like destiny. You know, wow, man, this is the, the big deal. I mean, if I had been there during the big deal, could, could I have done it knowing what I do? Who knew that he was going to get his chance again? Within one year of the collapse of the dot-com bubble, the carnage in our equity markets was so great that the Fed decided they had to do something that they hadn't done before. And in 2002, they came out with a statement that said monetary, ex major monetary and fiscal policies need to be instituted in place. They slashed interest rates down to 1%. And set in motion this enormous bubble. I don't know if they thought it was going to go out the way it was. I, mean, I don't know if they thought that guys from uh, who had a part-time job at Walmart could end up with a $500,000 mansion with, you know, with, my God, with a jacuzzi out back that, you know, that they saw in Beverly Hillbillies, you know, 
They, that, that they didn't know that all of a sudden the, the, the system had uh, loan origination, had broken down to such a point that, that the, the, the dogs could run freely. They, I don't know if they knew that. But when they saw it happening, they didn't do anything about it. This was brought to Alan's attention in, early, in, the, in the early part of this uh, 2003, uh, and he just blah, 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 because his intention was to get money into the system. No matter what it was, his intention was, was to get money in the system because he did not want to replay the 1930s. All right? What he succeeded in doing was he didn't get a replay of the 1930s on his watch. Okay? The man retired. He was knighted by Queen Elizabeth and he walked away and he got hired by Morgan Stanley or wherever he was and everybody loved this guy. He wrote his memoirs, just like they love Reagan. You know, you get out that door quick enough, you know. I mean, Reagan may not have had Alzheimer's. It may have been a brilliant way to deal with criticism. <laughs> Don't bother the boy. He's in a fog. Player doesn't recognize you. You know? Brilliant way. How do you get off the table when it comes down? But here we are in 2008 at an extraordinary moment in history. Extraordinary moment in history. And we are lucky enough to be sitting next to some guy who'd been looking at it for decades. And he gave me, I mean, it was really funny, because we're, as we're watching, we're getting close to this thing. And that's why your, your statement of the fracture is really good, because fracture implies visibility. Implies visibility. There's the, the oldest book in existence is from China. And it's called the Book of Changes, the I Ching. All right? And ma uh, being a mathematician, uh, Dr. Fekete might understand that it's based on the binary system of numbers, which did not exist in the West. All right? the, the Western system of numbers is a decimal system that we, we got from the Arabs. Okay? And it appeared in the, in the, in the West, uh, I don't know, maybe 16th century, 17th, I don't really know the exact century, but it's Leibniz figured it out on his own. Okay? And, and he was a mathematician, and he came up with this binary system of numbers, one, two, either or, either or, which is the basis of today's computers. All right? And he's sitting there, oh man, I mean, that's pretty decent to come up with a number, n new number system. And so he runs across his book, the I Ching, which had been translated, brought over from, by the Jesuit missionaries, missionaries to China, but you don't get a lot of missionaries over there. All right? That's a tough row, boy. You know, trying to get them to think the way you want them to think. All right? He brought this book back, and it, talked, it, was, it was an oracle book. It was like the Delphi Oracle. It purported to be able to tell you what was going to happen. It says there's only 4,096 possible situations in the whole playbook of mankind. All right? And time, space, gender, whatever, you're going to face with it, and you can ask it a question, you'll get the answer. So that's what, that's what the I Ching was. And so what happened is, is that the, uh, the, they, they come in here, and what it said about change was, change is always happening. I mean, if for example, what we consider change is, if for example, you, you put a, a pot of tea on, you know, you want some water, you know, for hot water for your tea. So you go to the stove and you put some water on it and then you turn it on and it starts boiling. And then you sit and you hear the, whatever the sound that makes you, oh, change, change has happened. You know, the teapot's boiling. It is true. But the e change says, no, 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 no. It's always been changing. The difference is you, the change to you became visible became manifest. There was a sign of that change in your level of perception, of reality. Change happened when you went over and put the water on. Change was happening when you put the heat on. Change may in fact started when you had the idea of wanting tea. Or perhaps even before that, if you want to get metaphysical about it. All right? So what happened is, is that this change thing happened here and it just hit us all at once. And this is where we are today. The fracture is visible. A year ago it wasn't. And now, where is that hairline fracture gonna go to? Okay? We now know that the markets are in a far different shape than they were last year. Last year, the debt markets for distressed debt, and then we're not saying badly distressed debt, just non-investment grade, okay, below, you know, double A or whatever it is. Georgia Pacific, Boston Scientific, some big names are up there. Okay, 71% of corporations today are rated non-investment grade. 50% of the debt out on the market is investment grade still because of the largest corporations still borrow. But you've got GM, Chrysler, Ford, non-investment grade junk, okay, huge corporations that were once investment grade bought over by private equity, got so much debt saddled on them, they're not investment grade anymore. 
All right. Last January, one year ago, January 2007, the amount of equity borrowed by uh, in non-investment grade uh, corporations in the credit markets was $8.5 billion. Not a bad sum. Went to the market, wrote down the thing, check was written, they went home, covered their expenses. Okay? Another year to play. This year, they went to the market, $850 million. 90% yeah. collapse of the market. That's a sea change. Alright? That's, that's there. Um, yesterday, or this week, um, a children's hospital offering uh, from California Community Services uh, went into the muni market. Uh, this week, uh, uh, Prince George County, Arundel County in Maryland went to the market to raise money for, you know, bond issues. No takers. No takers, they couldn't place it. And the market makers, who it's their responsibility once they bring you to market, have to take the market, have to take it. They are now refusing to make a market. The banks themselves, the investment banks that make a living placing debt in the markets, made a nice living at it, are no longer doing it. Why? We're out of money. They gotta shepherd this money. They need to make more money than the whatever they're making on, that, on those mini bonds. Where are we ending up? Where is that hairline fracture that wasn't visible last year? But I tell you, Professor Fetty takes that and he looked at these people driving around, you know? I mean, you know what it looked like to him for decades? What did it look like to Von Mises? What did it look like to, to all of those people who knew and saw what was really going on? Is now becoming visible to us, and there are people in the rest of those tales in the city that don't know it all, that don't have the famous. Well, you don't have to know what a white blood cell count is, you got AIDS. You don't have to know that. It doesn't matter. That's technicalities. But where's it going to lead to? Well, a couple of years ago, Martha turned and looked at me, and she said, when I was in the kitchen, and she said, Daryl, this is the kind of conversation, not all the conversations we've had in our house, but enough of them. She goes, Are you a deflationist? <laughs> you should know these things. Yeah, yeah. You should know these things about the with the, about the man you sleep with. Are you sleeping with a deflationist? Yeah. Are you a deflationist? And I turned around to her. And I, I I didn't even answer immediately. I, mean, I was sort of surprised she asked me that. And I said yes. I I am a deflationist. All right. And as you move towards this thing, as you see the tree falling, and as you see how it's fallen in the past. Well, what does a deflationist believe, or at least what I believe? Why did I say I was a deflationist? To me, it wasn't falling prices, though I know prices always collapse in deflation. <coughs> to me, deflation meant there's going to be a collapse of demand. That the economic body is going to take such a body blow, such an extreme body blow, that people are going to start grabbing, holding on. They're not going to be spending. You know, I wondered, you know, probably 10 years ago when I first began studying the Great Depression, what caused it? You know, I mean, why did people stop spending? Why, why did the toilet stop functioning? You know, why, why did the, what happened? All right? And it's all conceptual. It's like reading a book on sex and you're seven years old. Give a kid every diagram you can. You know? Have your parents explain it to you. I tell you, if you had that kid tell you what's going to happen, you'd be way off. All right? But when you get there, you see what's happening. People start contracting. They're not sure anymore. One year ago, I always remember, it was great. He said, there was so little risk in the market. He said, it's like, you know, riding in the cavalry was sitting there. You're going through Apache country. And one cavalryman said to the other, you know, it's awfully quiet. That's what it was. He was right. It was awfully quiet last year in January. Now, so we're seeing a deflation happen, all right? We're seeing a collapse of, it's just a fracture, all right? The fracture's there. We haven't seen the deflation yet. We haven't even seen the recession, you know? And I love this thing about a recession. Recession. Two consecutive quarters of declining economic activity. Generally, that has to be labeled by, we have a body. That, that a, a, I don't know the name of it, but there's some sort of professional body of economists that convene to say this is a recession or not. They meet every couple of years. 
<laughs> They're not expected to meet for at least a couple of years. All right? And I thought, that's sort of like saying, I mean, you got a life insurance policy, you know? Your dad got hit by a train, you know? A week ago. He's dead. They took him to the morgue, you know? You got expenses. And you're in mourning. And you go down and you go to the life insurance guy and he says, uh, well, Mr. Shoon, uh, we need to decide by the coroner. Well, the coroner ain't going to show up for another month. <laughs> My hands are tied. Won't declare him dead. He ain't dead till he's declared dead. That's the way we have our society run. So what you've got here is you've got a economic system that is absolutely, we are seeing something that, we, that we've really never seen before. I mean, and if it, ha if it happened before, we weren't there, all right? And if, if you were there in Japan, it didn't play out the way it did. I mean, I remember the arrogance, the arrogance of, in the, five years ago, people saying, well, this happens, it's gonna be like Japan, <clears throat> you know? Arrogance! The difference between us and Japan is extraordinary. We have no savings. The Japanese are the, one of the highest savings rate in the world. The, J the Japanese now have the highest GDP debt, government debt per GDP in the world, percentage-wise. They didn't have that before 1990, before it collapsed. We are the world's largest debt, largest debtor. Who's going to buy our paper? Somebody will, or they'll make it look like somebody does for a while. So here we are. We're headed towards what I consider deflation. Now, what I noticed on the way to this thing, and before I said that to Martha that I was a deflationist, I told her there was this big thing going over the internet about hyperinflation. Oh no, there's an inflationist and there's a deflationist. The hyperinflationist said, or the inflationist said, well they're going to pump liquidity in, they'll keep us afloat, and we're going to float our way out of this thing. We may go over the edge, but we're going to float our way out of it. We, we may even make it out of it. Deflation, oh, no, we're going to go out, we're going to sink, you know, we're going to sink. No, nah, we're going to float, we're going to sink, we're going to float. So that's what I want to talk about. I want to tell you about the possibility of maybe thinking we're floating at the bottom of the ocean. Okay? The possibility of these two things. But lead into it. Why does one lead into another? My projection is this. We are definitely in a recession. All right? Headed towards a deflation, which is going to play itself out. It's just A, B, C. One, two, three. You know? It's just simple. Collapse of demand. Velocity of money slows down. We're not at the. This is not a normal situation. I think this is the end of a, the end of a system. That's how bad I think it is. Bucky Fuller said in 1980, and this was a genius. Said in 1980, mankind is going to enter a period of unprecedented crisis, and he titled his introduction "Twilight of the World's Power Structures." Twilight of the World's Power Structures. After he published his book and died, Soviet Union collapsed. Boom! Oh, it went one. 25 years later, the other one's going down. My metaphor was it was sort of like during the 80s, you know, you had the Russians in there and the Americans going at it. The Russians drank a lot of the vodka. It wasn't in good shape at all. Really couldn't take it. Man, the Americans were pumped up on steroids, you know, that armament going in there. And they went in there and cut. all of a sudden, what happened in the middle of this fight, 15 round fight, the Russian didn't answer the bell. I mean, it wasn't like a bang went over and knocked him out and all of a sudden he's down and he's bleeding, you call him the doctors and he's dead. No, I sat there and, what, and you know, and he, he didn't answer the bell. Wow, I mean, no one expected it. Not the handlers over in the US corner didn't explain it all. Guy didn't answer the bell. As, as Professor Freckney said, not because of the opposition, because of his own internal economic contradictions. 25 years later, I don't know how we're going to do it, whether somebody's going to knock us out or not. I think we're going to not answer the bell either or fall out in the middle of one of the rounds. We have our own contradictory economic conditions that are coming to a head. All right? So I see ourselves headed into a deflation worse than the Great Depression. Worse than the Great Depression. This is something that is inconceivable to us. I mean, I was talking with my friend Marshall, who's an optimist, all right? I believe that we're going to And I said, Marshall, unprecedented, Bucky said. 
You knew Bucky. This man did not use words lightly. Unprecedented. You know, we've been through famines, we've been through world wars, we've been through nuclear wars, we've been through plagues, we've been through this, we've been through that. And he used the word unprecedented. Rest my case. Now what is unprecedented going to look like? And what is it going to happen to us? Well, I figure that this playing out process that we're going through right now, the fracture that's now visible, okay, is going to get more. Okay? Now, the system in which we're operating is not something on its own. It's very much a human system. Okay. There's people involved in both ends and both sides, consequence, holding together people. Some want to change it. Other, you know, Professor Peck Day, he knows how it used to work and um, he knows that the ch chances of it, we're, we're not going to resurrect. We're not going to go backwards until, until this one falls apart. But I, I, I want to talk about motive here. And uh, there's another little line here on motive. What do I think on motive? If you seek to understand the world of human activity, Look first to the self-interest of those involved. As true for the whole as it is for the parts, you will by so doing come to understand the actions of nations as well as the behavior of individual men and women. And when you do discover what the underlying self-interests are, you will discover too the actual nature of the self then being served. We have the central bankers which are quote-unquote and people want to believe that they're that they're keepers of the of the system. Well, in a, in a sense, they are. We're mistaken in thinking that it's our system. It's their system, and it's a system that's worked very. It's an extraordinary system. It's worked 300 years, taken over the whole world, got everybody on the same page. <laughs> I mean, as Professor Becker said, it's the first time in history that every country in the world has been on a fiat money system. That's some sort of accomplishment, you know? I mean, they went and took a world that somehow was stumbling along, you know, we had famines, we had stuff, and they lived through it and they recovered and stuff like that. And then there was this burst of just, uh, it was like steroids. Oh man, boom, all of a sudden, HGH steroid slamming, we had the Olympics, I mean, records were broken. Stadiums were filled, you know? People just were so proud of their accomplishments. Steroids, got some more of that stuff. Got some, oh yeah, I got a new concoction. Got the drip. What's this stuff? A drip of steroid. Much better than just, you know, low interest rates. Real sophisticated. And now we're at the point where Parkus next economic death is going to happen to this side. I think that deflation is inevitable just from the collapse of the demand side of the equation. Prices are going to chase demand down. All right? At least in the West. In the East, you still have some life. And there's still some demand there. So prices, they may sort of push prices up. Oh, isn't that good? Isn't that good? You know, at least you stop deflation? Well, it ain't going to be good for us. All right? I mean, we're going down. All right? Because we don't have any demand. We don't have any money. In the East, they're pushing the demand up. They still got some demand going. But they ain't gonna, I didn't tell you, they ain't going to go very far either. We're all connected together. We're not holding hands, we're chained to the waist. And this is gonna be a nasty collective experience for all of us. So what I see is deflation happening around the world, but I also see the inevitable, and I'm not saying it's inevitable, I'm saying it's a distinct possibility of hyperinflation happening on top of deflation. Why? Because the people who are trying to keep the game going they have one instrument called liquidity. All right? Because demand is slipping. Let's, let's get some more money out of it. Let's get some more money. Let's, let's give some more money. They have liquidity. So they're putting, as, as this boat is sinking, they're pumping more money into the situation. Now, the interesting thing about it is that hyperinflation, like a deflation, is an unexpected event. It happens under certain circumstances, but unlike um, other events, it is not set in motion consciously. It is inadvertently triggered. Pregnancy 
can be set in motion consciously. It can also be inadvertently triggered. A deflation and a hyperinflation are never set in motion intentionally. They're always inadvertently triggered. Caused by preceding economic events. They are monetary phenomena caused by the by shifting off of the constraint of the constraint uh, crucified on a cross of gold. Yeah. Isn't humanity? What we really want is do what we want to do. Humanity, the freedom to act without constraint, with, without anyone holding on saying, you know, like, hey, isn't it much better if you can print all the money you want? You know? I mean, without constraint. Without con matter if there's a 91 day cycle. Let's push it out to three seats. Let's push it out to multi, multi bazillion. Let's, 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 uh, let's expand. Let's get another battle going here. That's what we really want. That's human nature. Well, what is going, what is happening here is that the people, they, they have very few, they, they're very powerful. They are in the system at critical places and they're trying like hell to keep this thing afloat. They are in a place they've never been before. And I have absolute proof of it. For the first time, these son of a bitches are doing something to help saving the common man. <laughs> they got down to the little guy at the mortgage and said, oh, hey, listen, 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 you, you're going below? You know, I, mean, I, I, I know we, we, we set you, we did all these things to you, and we let you do this, but here, here, let me see if I can help you. <laughs> They're not there to help them. Except they now think they've got to help them to help themselves. If they can't help that little man, that little man may be the very plug holding the leak together. And if that man gets, and his family gets sucked in off of that plug because the, the, the force, the vacuum created by the resetting of the mortgage, the boat's gonna sink. So these guys are going around talking to the guys in the plugs, hey, hold on, hold on, I'm gonna be there, hold on, we're coming now, we're coming to you We're here to help you. Right. And you know what? I hope they help. There's going to be a lot of something going on. But I don't give them a chance. But that's why they're down there. That's what is a danger sign of how much trouble we're in. That's what they're doing. And you can see that their solutions are done on the fly. The SIV savior solution, the, the one that they tossed out that didn't do any good. I don't know what they're going to do with the Mona lines. They're going to come something there. Because they got to do something. But basically what these boys do, their one, their one weapon their one, in their arsenal is liquidity, is more money, more money, more money, more money, more money. This is the very trigger of hyperinflation. I want to give you a quote, 2006. 2006, this is a quote from Federal Reserve Bank, St. Louis. July, August edition, review, St. Louis Federal Reserve. Professor Lawrence Kolokoff. The gap between future U.S. receipts and future U.S. government obligations now totals $65.9 trillion, a sum that is impossible for the U.S. to reconcile, which means the U.S. is now technically bankrupt. Professor Kalitnikov also said <clears throat> that the United States has experienced high rates of inflation in the past and appears to be running the same type of fiscal policies that engendered hyperinflation in 20 countries over the past century. All right? Could you imagine what a hyperinflation will look like in the United States? It will be. Professor Fekete, when we were in um, Marshall flu, uh, the professor and his wife in, uh, my friend Marshall, to um, Los Angeles in, in, uh, in October, and Martha and I got some chance to spend some time with him. And, and uh, I, I have to say that I'm, I may not be slow, but I'm not that quick to understand the stuff he talks about. And every little inch helps. And I began to understand certain things about what he was saying, and this and that, and, and this and that. But he told us a story he, he, about what happened in, in Hungary. He was there doing the most virulent hyperinflation that has hit the world. The rate of In increase. In terms of string of zero. zeros. <laughs> he had to be, I, 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 mean, I thought, 
Maybe it turned out well that he, was, he turned into a mathematician as a result of this. <laughs> as a child, he was the only one in the house who could go down and not get burned when he was going to go buy some bread. Said Anton. <laughs> Daryl went and we're in debt. <laughs> you know? Did the wrong thing. Anton could figure it out. And it was, it was absolutely enormous. Well, here it is. The guy from the Federal Reserve saying that that's what we're doing. That hyperinflation in, in 20 countries, all right? Bill Gross over at PIMCO. This is what he said about where we are. Where we are. Oh, Richard Russell, Dow Theory Letters. There's no way all this debt can ever be paid off or even carried by stable economic systems. Forget that. This debt must be carried, handled by ever-increasing amounts of paper. That's from Richard Russell. All right? At some point, the U.S. may start running the printing presses to pay its bills. Indeed, it may already have done so, begun to do so. The decision by the U.S. Federal Reserve to discontinue printing, reporting, the total U.S. money aggregate M3 in March 2006, which was four months before Professor Kogoff came up with his little thing, may have been done to camouflage such printing. The situation is now so extreme, extreme measures will be invoked. It would do us well to remember the words of Bill Gross, managing director of the PIMCO bond fund. The way a reserve currency nation gets out from under the burden of excessive liabilities is to inflate, devalue, and tax. If the U.S. rapidly inflates the money supply due to devalues the current debt and future obligations, such an inflation of the money supply would lead to hyperinflation. This would be hyperinflation of the world's largest economy. If the U.S. runs the printing presses to inflate its way out of debt, a hyperinflation in the U.S. would take down the global financial system. Um, the fact that these economists running our country graduated from Princeton does that mean they're stupid. They've run. They've run games. The Council of Foreign Relations has run simulations of the possibilities of what can face us. All right? They run simulations. Um, when I was in Hungary, I, I uh, quoted um, Peter G. Peterson, head of the Council for Foreign Relations, who said two years ago to Chuck Harder, he said, Chuck, I foresee a, de a depression in the United States in three to five years. This is Peter G. Peterson, head of the Council for Foreign Relations. When Blackstone went public, he took $1.88 billion off the table personally. This man is plugged into the highest level. All right? They, have, they, they see where we're headed. We're in a war, all right? War is one of the situations that countries go into hyperinflation. It's a trigger event. It's a trigger event. The expenses of war are so enormous that war is often a trigger event for the horrendous and horrific after effects of hyperinflation. You know what the other common denominator is sometimes? Depression. <laughs> war, depression. Wow. And this is the, let's, let's talk about these people. What do they think, and let's surmise what they might be doing about it. Well, one of the most interesting things that I ran across in the last, just came up in the last month, came up through GATA. And um, one of the people on the board of GATA um, talked about the market makers for the Fed. Right? These are the people that the Federal Reserve goes to to institute Federal Reserve policy in the markets. We now, we know that they're in there. We know they're goosing this, they're doing that, the plunge protection team and stuff like that. And, you know, I mean, here we are. You know, it's sort of like um, dad's got cancer, but my God, he looks good, doesn't he? <laughs> We're only down, what is it, 12% off our highs? You know, I mean, I mean, geez, everybody's going, I hear he's got pancreatic cancer, look at that tan. Couldn't be that bad. You know, they've done a damn good job of it, keeping them afloat, you know? I mean, I sort of liken the, uh, the uh, central bankers to the, um, to the group of people that holds a life insurance policy on the United States economy. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna hold off as long as they can from paying it off because they've got enormous liabilities. All right? So they're sitting there. They know, you know, getting them healthy and stuff like that. But they've got makeup going. They've got, they've got people coming in. They've, they've got every juice system in the, in the world going on to get, helping, helping them stay alive. Well, what might this be? He ventured to say, and he keeps track of this, that 
central bank, uh, federal funds, the intervention by the Federal Reserve has led him to believe that they were leading the U.S. Dow down into a recession. All right? That it looks like they're trying to keep the prices up. But he said, if you examine the injections of liquidity, and what happens to the Dow when they come in, when they come in, when they come in? And he says, you know, this is a very close circle. You do what they tell you to do, and you don't, you're out of the game. Okay? And this is easy money. This is billions of dollars they pour in, and they do it, and he says, turn left, turn left, they do it, they turn left. And it's his opinion that they are leading us down to a Dow 8,000 point. Why? Because it is his opinion that they've come to the conclusion that they can perhaps mitigate a hyperinflationary flashpoint if we send our country into a recession beforehand. Lower the demand enough. So we're so low in the water, we're so down that the printing doesn't start happening and start causing things to go up. Well, it's an interesting thought. I mean, we've never been there before, have we? Not in the United States. Not with a hyperinflation. Just like Alan Greenspan had never been at the helm before we had a class of a bubble. You know, I mean, he turned to one of his friends in 2003 and said, you know, what we're doing is highly unorthodox. <laughs> you know, it's like the Mormons on a gang rape. You know, and there they are. It's kind of, you know, it's highly unorthodox. There they were, and they did it. Because you don't have a lot at your disposal. We're in a huge war. And they voted themselves a tax cut. Is that the action of management that leads you to believe that these boys are thinking they're in the air for the long term? No. There is no long term. Not for the way they see it. They're trying to steer the disaster that they see coming. All right? Carlisle, the rumors were there also that Carlisle had a war chest. Knowing that we're going to go into depression, they're going to pick up stuff, pennies on the dollar. Timing wasn't too good. They got caught halfway in the private equity buyout. They got their foot stuck in the cement. But this is what these people are looking at. This is what they're thinking about. And to end this, uh, what is it? I ran across a paragraph in here on hyperinflation. This is very interesting. I just want to read this. Um, hyperinflation effectively wipes out, this came from Wikipedia, um, purchasing power of private and public savings, distorts the economy in favor of extreme consumption and hoarding of real assets, causes the monetary base, whether specie or hard currency, to flee the country, and makes the afflicted area anathema. I think I pronounced it wrong, to investment. Hyperinflation is met with drastic remedies, whether by imposing a shock therapy of slashing government expenditures or by altering the currency basis. An example of the latter is placing the nation in question under a currency board as Bosnia-Herzegovina did in 2005 which allows the central bank to print only as much money as it has in foreign reserves. Another example is the dollarization is dollarization. <laughs> what an ironic statement this is. I'm going to finish reading the sentence so you'll see the irony. The, is dollarization as Ecuador officially initiated in September 2000 in response to a massive 75% loss of the value of their currency. Dollarization is the use of a foreign currency, not necessarily the US dollar, as a national unit of currency. Ecuador was in so much trouble that they said, all right, our money is worth squat. The dollar is now the only thing that's going to be, that's going to be used. 2000, they said, and they used the dollar. All right? I want to just put on the table, as I end this, the possibility that this is what the Amero is supposed to play. The Amero was something that I heard first from the nuts off the internet. You know those guys out of Texas. <laughs> guys out of wackos from Waco. Right. So sorry, Frank. That's why you're from Michigan originally. Okay. You live down here with these people. Right. I sat up there in California with all my judgments. Right. 
nuts, nuts, nuts. Conspiracy, conspiracy, conspiracy. Okay? Marrow, marrow, marrow. Mexicans, marrow, Mexicans, marrow. Then you looked at it. You went, wow, marrow, what is this? North American Union? Hmm, interesting. A currency with Canada, Mexico, and the United States. I think about it. Hmm. And then I see a clip of Vincente Fox. You know? On the news. I mean, he was past president of Mexico. But more importantly, he was past president of Coca-Cola. There are many past presidents of Mexico that would never know be led into the club. But if you're both past president of Coca-Cola, past president of Mexico, I mean, shit. Yeah, you're you're there, boy. You know, you're you're there, okay? And he was talking about the Amero. And they, they brought it up and he sort of laughed. He said, well, you know, it's one of these met things. What do you think? Why are you, uh, we're hearing about this thing called the Amero, this new currency, the United States, this currency union of Canada, the United States of Mexico. What do you think about it? You know, the guy's expecting some blah, blah, blah. And Vincente Fox goes, yeah. yeah. It will probably be coming to pass sometime in the future. You know, in fact, it was envisioned to be much larger than that. Except Hugo Chavez came in and screwed the thing up. You know, they wanted the whole Americas to have their own currency realm. All right? Then it would really be the Amero. Now it would just be the Norte Amero, or uh, Amero Norte, you know, or Amero Sans Hugo, you know? That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, no Hugo. Amero Light. Amero Light. Very good. Very good. No covenants on this Amero. And so I go, wow. You know, maybe these Texans have got a little, you know, something to the paranoia. As they often do. As they often do. I have to exceed that. I won't exceed the ultimate result of the paranoia, but I will exceed the fear as well founded. So, there's the Amero. I'm thinking, hmm, Amero, okay, so there it is. The Canadians would never go for it. I mean, the Mexicans, of course they would. You know, I mean, they're about as stable as a Mexican after, or American after a, a fifth of tequila. You know, they're up and down and, you know, like this, and really unstable. And if they got a chance to align, I mean, I, I don't know, they, they don't, the people would hate it. You know, I mean, what was one of those sayings? So far away from God and so close to the United States. That's a Mexican saying, and they say it in Spanish, you know. But that's really their attitude about us, the, the people themselves. Vincente, he's got another feeling about it, you know. But the Mexican people don't like this idea any more than those boys in Texas like the idea of hands across the border idea. But I thought, you know, the real opposition would come from Canada. Now I know the Canadians run their little deficits and they got, you know, they got their problems up there and uh, and. Um, and uh, I know they got that acid back paper, asses, you know, I call it ass paper up there. They got heavily into that to bail themselves out. And, you know, they're a rather small, fragile economy, but man, resource rich. Heading into a world where you're going to need resources. I mean, and you're going to hook it up with the greatest debtor in the world. You're going to take those sands that are loaded with gunk. You know, that under certain conditions may produce oil and connected to the outstanding, uncontrollable debt of the United States. You'd be fools to do that. It's a pipe dream. Pipe dream, you know, that blew some smoke into the ear of, you know, those Vincente down there, got him swooning. But you're never going to sell those Calypso. You guys are too smart. You know, guys up there are too smart. Yes. <laughs> Then I run to this goddamn paper. Absolutely amazing. North American monetary integration. Here comes the Amero. However, despite being conveyed as quote unquote purely theoretic, theoretical, this is from January 20th, 2008, Global Research. A recent article in the National Canadian newspaper, the Financial Post, referred to the Amero not as a theoretical idea or a conspiracy theory but as a potential reality. The article entitled Fix the Looney lays out the process to be undertaken before the adoption of a continental currency known as the Amero. The article was written as a response to a previous article written in defense of Canada's flexible exchange rate system to which it states, quote unquote, 
David Laidler's recent defense of Canada's flexible exchange rate system misses completely the point made by Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Mundell in his famous article on Ottoman currency er areas. Mundell's article has been widely created, credited with providing the intellectual basis for the, inter for the European Monetary Union and merits attention. It continued, Milton Friedman, your friend, the horse owner, <laughs> okay, great horseman. Horse trainer. <laughs> oh, horse trainer, okay, all right. Milton Friedman's response to Mundell was that he would not advocate flexible rates for every possible reason. Because <laughs> Mundell said, well, why not for Ontario, Alberta, you know, Manitoba. Not for every region, but certainly for North America. And I read this article, I went, wow, this is serious. I mean, this article quotes people from Simon Fraser Institute. You know, I mean, I have my attitude about right wing think tanks as a place where thinking comes. But it does show proximity to power. And this article went on in its several pages and laid out the support that it would give them stability as their resources went up and the dollar would, you know, their, 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 their Canadian dollar would go up too and it, it damaged the country. That's what happened in Switzerland. Okay, and they had to react to it. So they had a flexible thing, they'd be able to keep their prosperity. And you know what? When you're handing out paper, the truth can look mighty damn dim when you're close to the paper. And those think tanks are filled with people on grants, writing for situations, preparing the soil. More empty than fertile for these ideas to be dropped in place. So, my thought is, as we are lumbering down this, I mean, the last section on my speech in Hungary was, it was a terrible title. I looked at it and said, the road to the future is a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder people don't want to buy my book. <laughs> Mr. Hope, you know? Mr. Transformation. <laughs> He's selling enough. Found an audience. But my sense is the fracture is a lot more visible than it was before. Um, the, and as uh, Professor Fekete points out, these people are not without tricks. They're not without power. And there's a certain inertia to a system that will keep it going as long as it can. But I think they're up against not only the marketplace, I think they're up against history. My feeling is that this is a deep, deep, deep paradigm shift that Bucky talked about that involves more than money. It involves us as a people. And it's, and it's huge. And it's, and it, it's uh, the system that we've been through is, has played its role, as all systems do. And it's done what it's done. And now that, that humanity's done with that, we're going to go to another level. But between now and there, is going to be something that's just going to be, uh, I mean, I don't want to think about it. In fact, you don't have to think about it. I mean, reading about puberty wouldn't have prepared us at all. I mean, I probably wouldn't have come out of my room if I read enough of what it was going to be like. But, like Pascal's wager, you don't have a choice. You're at the table. And here we are, my friends. Here we are. Right at that edge. And I expect that we are going to have a, def a recession, a palpable recession, morphing into a deflationary depression, probably in another two years, two to three years at the most. Moving, um, inflation's already afoot. I mean, what is it? Uh, inflation rates, Saudi Arabia's at a 16 year high, Switzerland's at a 14 year high, Singapore's at a 25 year high. All right, um, money growth. Australia, year to year, M3, up 20%. Brazil, up 17%. Canada, 12%. Guy's got some restraint going up there. Congratulations. Great conservative. Great conservative. <laughs> Hold that line. Hold that line. China, was 18%. Eurozone, 12%. Hong Kong, 31%. India, 21%. U.S., historic high, 15.8%. Uh, estimated because uh, they ain't telling. <laughs> All right. I mean, you tell any wife when her husband starts uh, not showing her his phone records, something's afoot. All right? Let me show you how good a wife the American people are. Yeah, you can ask some questions about it. So in the midst of this denial, in the midst of this ignorance, we sit here on a boat 
All right? And I think what distinguishes us from the rest of the world, because we're all in the same boat. I mean, Alan's up there in a nice suit, you know, but we're in the same boat. What we're doing is we're looking at the hole. Wow, man. I mean, look at that. Look at that water going like that. All right? And, and, and it, it gives us some sort of um, confidence that, that at least we're looking at this thing that we, that, that, that we know somebody who's watched it for a long time and can tell us how it may fracture and what we may do and after, the, after the boat goes down and we swim and make it to shore and start have to start from scratch again. That there is, you know, I mean, I like what your statement about it, Nathan, is that it gave you hope that this stuff is natural. You know, just like, you know, as the professor said, you put those three things in the thing and it comes out, boom, there it is. We're, we're not... We're not operating alone. We're in a context that's bigger than us, and we're a part of it. And it's morphing. And, you know, I would have given everything not to morph through this period of time, I think. You know, I think I would have. Maybe I did choose to be here at this time, you know. But it wasn't my choice during puberty, and it's not my choice during this time. So, uh, rock and roll. There it is. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Now that, now that you made all the audience depressive, uh, <laughs> would you give uh, a, a recipe to survive? Or how you are intending to survive this period? This period, okay. Um, the cookbooks don't exist. It's like puberty. You can read it, you can see what's happening and stuff like that. I think the framework, the economic framework, is, is, is going to be, you know, Bucky said something that's absolutely amazing. And because and, and, I think he, he saw where we're headed towards. He had a vision so big that, you know, that it included what we're going through. And Bucky said, our journey, this crisis is an unprecedented crisis. And it's going to take us from a competitive, scarcity-based, antagonistic, polarized society. I mean, look around, folks. All right? You don't got to read the subtitles. You just got to keep your eyes open and see what's happening. To a harmonious, Interdependent world. Right? It's the transition that's. Yes. But it's going to be a crisis so deep, it's going to force it. Alright? That the elements that are there for us to cooperate with each other are not going to be theoretical. Wouldn't it be nice if we help one another? We're going to be forced to. I think we may be taken down to the line where we may actually get to practice you are your brother's keeper. Or hope he thinks the same of you at that time. We are going to see something that's going to sweep us away. But I want to say something. We are a part of something more than we know. And it's in us now. It was in us before we were born. It's going to be in us after we're here or we're transiting through this. And it's going to force us to go to, there was, a, there was an amazing statement that I, that I read in, in Carlos Castaneda's book. I don't know if, how many are familiar with the work of this guy. He, he was a graduate student at UCLA, and he met a, uh, a shaman, a North American Yaqui Indian, okay, Don Juan. And I loved it, because here at Car Carlos Castaneda, he made no bones that he really was, you know, Don Juan used to sort of make fun of him. You know, he'd come down there and, you know, Don Juan's this Indian. He's a Yaki Indian. Here, Carlos Castaneda, kind of graduate student at UCLA. You know, hey, that's a good school. All right? And Don Juan would make fun of it. Like, sort of, well, you think a lot of yourself. Like, well, I don't know. I don't know. No, I don't. You know? Yeah. You think I'm an in stupid Indian. You think you're some sort of smart guy. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you know, you know, embarrassingly direct. All right? He spent some time with this man and found out that this man was in a repository of tremendous spiritual strength and insight. Tremendous strength and insight. Okay, I mean, he was in awe of who Don Juan was. Walked around like an Indian, just like an Indian, and he was an Indian. And, and I remember this, I, I, of all these stories that you read, this is one, I, I, one of my favorite stories. He, he was at a market in Mexico, and he saw Don Juan. Okay, I'm surprised. He, you know, he didn't expect to see him there. And Don Juan didn't expect him there. But there was Carlos down there in Mexico. And he, he saw Don Juan. But Don Juan was dressed in a suit. <laughs> I mean, every time you see him before, he was, you know, like an Indian. And he went, wow, he's dressed in a suit, you know. And um, Don Juan sees him. He comes over. Oh, hi, Carlitos. Oh, hi, Don Juan. You know, like, all the respect like this. And Don Juan's, I mean, Carlos Castaneda said, little thought in his mind go, I wonder if he's wearing socks. 
Yeah, stadium. Is if on cue, Don Juan goes down, ties his shoe, takes just enough sight that you can see that sock. And he said, you know, Carlito, he says, I'm not wearing, he said, I'm wearing this suit and it's custom tailored. But it's not custom tailored because of my vanity. It's custom tailored because it reflects the perfection that I am. And that you are too. We are a perfection that we don't know about. But I know of that perfection. And he went on later to talk to Don Juan about the Indian experience. He said it was terrible. He said, what happened to the Indian culture when the white man came to America? He said, it was worse than dogs. We, it was worse than dogs. And we saw ourselves as, as worse than dogs. It was terrible. It just decimated every belief and the sense of who we were and stuff like that. He said, but for the few of us, it was an opportunity. It forced us back into places that we had forgotten existed. It forced us back to a reality that only had existed in legend. And he said, that's when we became men of power. That's when we, that's when we became men of power again. And, and your question, Judith, is, is, is right. Um, it is right to ask the suggestions about this transition because I'm not sugarcoating how I think it's going to be easy to do. You know, it's, it's going to be very difficult. But I think that each and every one of us has a light in them. All right? And the light is not to punish us. The light is not to hold our feet to the fire. The light is not to, ah, how do you know about that? You know? No, no, no. It's merely going to bring us each to a situation that will release those emotional blocks inside each and every one of us to achieve our potential. And in a greater sense, you look at it socially. The evil, and it is evil, though it has produced great wealth and great abundance, the system's really sort of dicey. Right? And it wasn't going to change on its own accord. And I don't think it was part of God's great plan. Right? I, I think it was part of God's great plan in the step of where he wants us to go. All right? But I don't think this was at any point. You know, in God's way. I don't think he, you know, did six days and looked around and saw the markets and the derivative markets and he saw the fragility of the system and he saw all these people with their pensions uh, uh, unknowingly invested in CDOs and, and God said, this is good. And <laughs> he rested. I don't think he did that. I think we're on the edge of a great thing. And, um, and I believe that. I think we're on the edge of a great thing greater than we can ever have seen ourselves. When the feudal ages collapsed, it collapsed into the Renaissance. When the Renaissance collapsed, it collapsed into the Enlightenment. When the Enlightenment collapsed, it collapsed into, quote, the level of British imperial, which is the last stage we're in now. And I expect that history will not necessarily repeat itself, because it doesn't, but history is going to move again to another level, and we are part of that history. And it's not something that we're just dust and get, get ground into and put together the hydrocarbon levels and, and stuff like that. That's the fear. The same fear that was in my brain that uh, I'm sure was in there when I found out this thing about girls was out there. What was I going to do? <laughs> Man, and I didn't come up with any good ideas on my own. Let me assure you that. And I'm quite happy. And so I'm sort of hoping that the same kind of thing is at play. The same kind of momentum, the same kind of uh, structure that underlies the, mo the uncertainty that my mind will project on the situation. And that we will be led and that we'll make it through there and, and we'll, it'll, it's going to be better. But I'm not going to say it's going to be easy. And I won't say that. It's a failure that's been, uh, it's, it's not unprecedented. It's just the scale. Yes, grand. the scale is grand. It's an immoral departure of, from a system that worked. That worked. And the con you know, to speak for, for America, if you take the Patriots, Thomas Jefferson, and this, you know, you can approach it from different types of solution, solutions, Daniel Webster, a political solution. You start with somebody like Ron Paul, and you know, we just departed, we lost it, and we had amoral behavior at the highest levels. Yes. And maybe you'll get into the abuse of the fractional reserve banking system, I think you can pinpoint a few causal triggers that, you know, the decision was made to decouple from a standard that was proven over time. And, uh, and I, 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 I'm, 
have some optimism. I don't know from our in our generation, we'll see it. Maybe it's going to take some time to play out. But you just, you need moral behavior, and you need to have people held accountable at the highest levels. And um, if there's, if, if, you know, if we're going to survive in any sort of democracy or restore democracy. Uh, you're going to need that because otherwise, you know, we'll be in the dark ages. Yeah. We will be slaves, uh, and we're kind. Of, we've we're, we're on we the are. path. Yeah. So, uh, Nathan. Uh, yeah, Nathan. Question. Sorry. If I can add, uh, Daryl, to your to your answer to your uh, Judith's question. The best short recipe I've ever seen that summarizes some of the most important things of how to make it through this kind of time was. I'm pretty sure it was at the end of. Um, uh, the Great Reckoning by uh, Davidson and Reeves Mom, mm -hmm. where they where they just talked about it was very simple things like keep your mind sharp, you know, and, and cultivate things that don't cost money to entertain yourself, like Scrabble, and uh, keep a close keep a close network with your friends, be out of debt, of course. And I think he gave an example of you know villages, you know, small towns will will stick together and plant food and things like that. But this leads to a larger question. This is what I deal with when I present to the investment advisors. I usually, if I haven't talked to a group before, I usually get the get it out of the way right at the beginning. I'll say, you know, I'm not here to talk about the end of the world, and whatever percent chance that has of occurring is irrelevant to your decision, you know, whether to invest in gold. And I say, because it may happen, but you have to plan that it's not going to. You have to assume, even if it's, you know, like I said, however likely it might be, if the world is going to be saved and we don't slip into a new dark ages where 99% of the population starves to death and the rest are reduced to savagery, if we don't slip into that, it'll be because people still believe in the American dream. They still believe that if they work hard, they can hit, get ahead, which is ultimately true. It's just unfortunately, just like you know, the pioneers, uh, many of them died you know, uh, uh, in the pursuit of it. Process, but it doesn't mean that it's not true. And you know, I, I try and make it hopeful. I try and say, look, folks, I mean, there are lots and lots of people who are still trying to get to America and who are willing, you know, to undergo great uh, difficulty and work extremely hard, literally, to work themselves to death. That is what will save the system and give us a chance to build a better uh, free market, uh, you know, proper system again, a proper political system again. Um, but, um, sorry, I got a bit off track there. The uh, uh, the, the recipe for survival is, you know, and, and, and you're probably much better uh, equipped having lived through communist uh, Hungary uh, than most of the people in, in North America, unless they've had similar experiences. Uh, you know, I mean, my parents lived in just the very tail end of the Depression, my mother, uh, and, you know, she's often pointed out that our whole generation has never really been to that, never had to do that. I hope that it doesn't cause our civilization to fly apart of the seams when the welfare checks stop coming, uh, which I worry, uh, you know, it may happen, but. If it does, so be it. I mean, you know, what's the most? I've been reading Robert Heinlein recently, uh, the science fiction writer. He's actually much more hopeful. He's, he's, you know, he's as correct as Ayn Rand is, but he's much more hopeful than her. She only presented, you know, the, the image of the world entirely collapsing and then being saved. Uh, Heinlein sort of says, well, you know, civilization does go through troughs and peaks. And he presented, you know, a future history uh, where the world went through several of those and still managed to pull itself out. It's a more hopeful view. Um, sort of one last point I wanted to make about the. Uh, uh, oh yeah, but but I mean, if, if you want to be depressed, read a book like uh, The Postman or Lucifer's Hammer, and you'll see, you know, the <laughs> yeah. of, you know decency. Yeah, you yeah. see, you see the absolute, you know, worst case scenario, which really there's not much point in worrying about. I mean, I would say that no matter how intelligent and fit and prepared and how good a shot you are and how good a you know, martial artist you are, you probably have about a 1 in 10,000 chance of surviving that kind of world anyhow. And you might not even want to survive it. So it's almost like, yeah. yes, it's there. Collapse of, collapse of civilization is a possibility, but don't worry about it. Yeah. because it's, uh, The analogy I use with the brokers is if, if a storm were bearing down on you, if you lived in Florida and a storm or a uh, class 5 hurricane were bearing down on you, don't think about the fact that a tree might fall on your house and kill you. Go ahead and board up your windows anyhow and make sure that you have food and water. You might die in a storm, but there's no point in even worrying about that. You know, assuming you can't flee or yeah. assuming you can't get out. Yeah. Uh, don't even worry about that. Just carry on with the sensible things. You know, buy your gold, uh, keep your financial affairs in order, and keep a good network of friends. And that's that's the best you can do to get through whatever, whatever's coming. This group is talking among itself as survivalists. I mean, you know, to say that we know it all, I think we are prepared for certain. Uh, the exigencies, but, but the doctor's point is, and the failure is, for people who depend on the public welfare, widows and orphans, 
and not to be have to be speculators to go about your daily business. That's true. And you know that uh, yeah. if this group, if there's something to come from this sort of exercise, you know, I think that's uh, and and your biggest gift to this group to me is the sense of where our leaders have led us astray. Okay, and from the pure democratic spirit and an economic a free market system that has worked. Okay. It, and and we have you know we we have to have that that sense of welfare for people that you know, caring. That's why you know of all the things. Antal, what attracted me to you was your insight about the bond speculator. <laughs> wow, I never saw that before. All right, and that attracted me. But what kept me on you was your humanity. What kept me with you because there's a lot of economic theorists out there who are just as cold as nails, all right? And your care about the producers and the savers, about the widows and orphans, about the ones who get chewed up by the quick and the clever in a system that they devised. 